Welcome to Rotary and Serving Our Community. My name is Wade Nomura, and today we're going to take a look at how the governance works with Rotary International through the Council on Legislation. With me today I have Steve Lingenbrink. Steve, welcome. Hi, Wade. Um, you're from Seattle area. You just flew in here today, correct? That's right. Just landed uh, about a half <laughs> hour goodness. ago. Well, thanks for joining us. I sure appreciate it. You bet. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, um, I'm a practicing attorney in the Seattle area. I actually live over in uh, Bellevue, Washington. And I've been married for uh, 26 years. I've got two daughters, uh, one that's 19 years old and one that's 21 years old. And the 19-year-old is going to Seattle University, and she's a member of the Seattle Rotaract Club. Great, great. And um, profession-wise, what do you do? Well, I just mentioned I'm, a, I'm an attorney. Okay. I do... Uh, personal injury work in the uh, small law firm over in Kirkland, Washington. Okay, okay. And uh, how about Rotary? What got you involved with Rotary? Well, that's um, the short version of the story <laughs> is um, I was actually reluctantly attending on a Friday morning. I'd been asked uh, the evening before at a chamber mixer whether I'd be interested in attending a, um, a Rotary meeting. And I went to the meeting intending to go one time and let the guy know that, you know, thanks for the invite, but... Rotary's not my thing. I ended up getting very, very warmly greeted and was treated like an honored guest. Um, I looked around the room and got to know some of the people and I realized that this was a group of friends that uh, get together on a regular basis um, and do great things in their community and around the world and have fun doing it. And so I ended up joining and the rest is history. <laughs> That's good. How about your uh, Rotary experience? What would be one of the highlights that you've had as a Rotarian? Well, uh, serving as governor in 2012-13 of our, of our district was probably the pinnacle of the, the actual Rotary experience, but some of the international service projects that I've been on in, in Russia and Romania, Africa and uh, South America have really been the highlights. Uh, being able to take my family, particularly my kids at a young age, and letting them see how the rest of the world live was an eye-opening experience for my family, and I really believe it changed the way that my kids look at the world today. That's true. They, that's an awesome experience for them at such a young age, too, to, to be able to experience that. Let's talk a little bit about now the uh, Council on Legislation. Tell us a little bit about it. What is the Council, the Council on Legislation? Well, you know, it's a funny question that a lot of people don't know the answer to because it's, you hear about the Council on Legislation, it's like, well, what is it exactly? Well, they meet every three years, and they usually meet back in uh, where we met in, in Chicago. And one representative gets picked to go from each district in the entire world. And as you may know, at the time there were uh, last year, or excuse me, earlier this year, 2016, there were 534 districts. And so at the council, 523 representatives were certified. And they were there f to, uh, for the week to uh, listen to uh, proposed legislation. And there's two different types. There's the enactments and there's the resolutions. And the proposed enactments are to actually change one of the RI documents like the Constitution, the RI bylaws, or the standard club constitution. And the resolutions are a request to the board to uh, look into some particular matter. And um, the specifics of this year was there was 117 proposed enactments and 64 proposed resolutions that we heard during the week. It's a fascinating process. Definitely so, it, it really was. Um, and something interesting too of the those that didn't attend because there was a, a handful, what was it, about eight or nine that were not actually in attendance. Um, part of it had to do with health, I'm sure, but the other portion of it, which is pretty fascinating, is the fact that we as um, delegates have to be certified. Right. And so that may have been one of the other issues. So tell us a little bit about the commitment, that going through the process to becoming certified as a delegate for the council. Well, in my district at least, uh, you go through an interview process, and there was a panel of five past district governors and you would go in and they would have a series of questions that they would ask you about, you know, what you knew to test your knowledge to make sure you understood what the council was about. 
how you were going to poll the clubs and the district to, to get the pulse to know exactly how to re best represent the constituents of your district, but also, more importantly, probably, how were you going to communicate that back to your clubs and your districts, both to get proposals for changing legislation, but also to keep them abreast of what was going on during the process. And as you know, we used um, social media to a large extent to, to keep them uh, informed. Sure. Yeah, yeah, that is good. Um, I brought with us some pictures. Why don't we jump into some of the pictures because uh, the pictures kind of give more of a sense, a feel of what it was actually like there. So the first picture is a picture of uh, you and me actually at the council itself. Fortunately, we got to sit next to each other. That doesn't happen very often, but if you want to go over some of the other people that were sitting in that same region or area that we were sitting, uh, it was pretty international, I would say. It really was. And, you know, if I could, um, that's a part that kind of I wasn't prepared for, um, the emotional experience of being involved with the internationality of all of the representatives there. It was really pretty overwhelming when the, when the session first started. And I went there with a little bit of a jaded attitude, thinking that maybe this was us rubber stamping things that had already been decided. And it only took a few of the uh, proposed enactments and to hear the very passionate debate to understand that we were really an important part of a process that was taking place where Rotary every three years actually reviews all of its governing documents. And, and then proposes changes to them. I don't know of any other organization that does that. So on one side of me was a gentleman that didn't speak English from South America. The other side of me was a gentleman from uh, Italy who spoke with just a little bit of English and, and uh, they were all had their earbuds in and everything was being translated. Yeah. yeah, that is true. Um, what else I thought found fascinating about the, the council itself was the time commitment because they moved us around one mm -hmm. other time so we were reassigned different seats but that was five and a half days of actually sitting down and just going through different documents. That was uh, pretty overwhelming in itself. It was and, and a, little bit, uh, a little bit grueling physically and emotionally. True. Yeah, it, yeah. it was true. The next picture we have actually shows the, uh, the council itself. Uh, this picture was taken uh, from across, and people don't realize the size of you know what it takes to sit 530 plus people in in one room to to go over this. The next picture we have shows a picture of your workstation. You yeah, want to go over some of the things that we have there. Right, um, actually, there's uh, you can see our name plaque there on on the top left, but then um, my iPad is right next to that. This was the first year that they had all of the proposed enactments, the proposed resolutions, the statements in favor and opposed, all submitted to us electronically. So we'd fire up an app in the morning and it would bring up the, the items that were up for consideration in that particular day um, and they were right there live streaming. We also had an old school printed version of it in that huge notebook that, that's underneath there, which was about, what, three and a half, four yeah, inches that thick. that we had to carry everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> Must have weighed four or five pounds. And then sitting on top of it, we've got the four cards, which I'll explain, and then the electronic uh, voting uh, mechanism, because all the voting, unless it was just to call the question or something, was done electronically and, and privately. And then we've got the three cards. We've got the, the green card for... Uh, a yes vote, the red for a no, the yellow for an amendment or to ask for clarification, and then the, the stripe card was for the, uh, to call the question. Right. Yeah. And uh, knowing that the budget is fairly tight with that many delegates, uh, it was interesting that they asked for all the cards back. So I guess they recycle those things. <laughs> I think they're going to. <laughs> yeah. Good. The next picture we have is a picture showing the uh, translation booth. Um, we have a few of those pictures which was pretty fascinating how that worked out. Tell us a little bit about the translation and how that worked in radio simultaneous uh, was, cast. It was pretty amazing to me because when um, somebody would get up to the podium to speak, they would have to identify themselves, identify what, where they were from in the world, and then what language they were going to be using. And so right then, the people that were in charge of this would switch over to the channel um, for whatever you were looking. So if we were listening in English, it would, it would all of a sudden come live on your headset 
and you could hear the person out there speaking in you know, Spanish or whatever language they were speaking in, and, but through your headphone it was coming through in English so you could, could hear, and it was all simultaneous uh, in multiple different languages so everybody could hear and understand what was going on. And there were probably about a dozen different languages at that point in time? I don't remember the number for sure. I know it was something it was, like that. Yeah, it was pretty fascinating. Certainly, everybody there was able to understand, you know, what was going on in their native right. tongue. Very true. So the next picture also shows it from a different angle, a different direction. But this is uh, located actually inside uh, where we were sitting. And what the fascinating part of that was is that they had people coming in and out. They were actually doing shifts of the people working each of those booths. So that was fascinating. The third picture shows a picture of a young lady. I believe that was the one that was being translated from Korean, I think. I think you're right. And um, again, um, these translators have to be pretty fluent in both the English and Spanish, and I did, or in the other languages. And I noticed they were pretty good at being able to translate back and forth because they're still understandable, even though that may have been their second language being English. Yeah, that was surprising to me that they could stay up with it so well because, uh, boy, the person would end speaking and then within seconds the, uh, the translation would end. And so they were staying right up with it. They were. They were. The next picture we have is a picture of uh, the presider. That's uh, Dwayne Benton and um, also with Mark Maloney seated next to him as one of the assistants. What was the role of, of the, that person? Could you give us a little overview of what Dwayne actually did? <laughs> He had a hard job, um, boy, I tell you, because he, he would have to decide basically when there'd been enough uh, discussion on a particular topic. He'd have to interrupt people if they were trying to use the amendment card for something that it wasn't entitled to be. And, and in fact, we saw that quite frequently during the process. Um, he would look back and see how many red cards and green cards there were in line. And if he saw five or six green cards and thought, well, we've heard enough on those in favor, let's hear somebody against, he'd jump back and he'd get a red card to come forward. Uh, and then he had to kind of moderate the whole, the whole room to make sure that uh, decorum was kept. Um, but most importantly, he would have to decide when it was appropriate to recognize the stripe card so that it was time to vote. And then either have a live vote where people would hold up their, their green or red card or do it privately using the electronic voting. Right which, as you know, we ran into a couple challenges on. <laughs> a, a few challenges out there, right, right. But he did do a great job. One thing mm -hmm. I give Dwayne credit for was the fact that he kept it light. Uh, you yeah. know, it wasn't quite serious to the point to where it was intimidating. People were still willing to step forward on that. Yeah, he knew when to throw a little humor in there, didn't he? He did. He, did. he <laughs> was very good at that. The next picture we have shows the, uh, the front area, and this is the people that were actually in charge of the uh, council. I want to say in charge. They were the reference points. They were the ones running and presiding over the event itself. The lady talking was one from Rotary International's legal department, mm -hmm. I, I believe. And she, again, was very knowledgeable. She stepped in mostly for procedural matters, correct? Right, for procedural matters. And then seat, seated next to them to the um, stage right or to our left there um, was the um, Constitution and Bylaws Committee. Right. And they got quite a workout during this particular legislation because, uh, or council, because there was a lot of um, fairly progressive enactments that were being discussed and uh, they would affect many other existing parts of the manual of procedure and so they were going to them frequently to get uh, counsel on, on um, whether it was you know correct interpretation or not before it could be voted on. Right and it was interesting too as you say the um, chain reactions that occur once something is, is looked at how it affects some of the other bylaws and written documents. Mm -hmm. The picture we have next is uh, one of the young ladies she was explaining to us at that time how to use the voting machines. So. Um, Tell us a little bit about that. How, how do you think that went about, uh, the electronic voting? Well, as you know, uh, there was a little um, herky-jerky in the first, uh, the first day. Um, we had to do multiple different tests using the equipment, and the equipment actually um, wasn't seeming to pick up all of the votes. And uh, they were very concerned about that, so they ran multiple tests, and they finally decided that, you know, I don't think that the, it's working the way that it should. 
And so they brought in overnight a whole new entire voting system, which worked flawlessly from there on out. True. Until the batteries wore Until out. Until the batteries wore out <laughs> on the last day. <laughs> and that... that uh, next picture we have is um, yeah. a picture showing uh, some of the results, correct? How that was voted on and... Right. As you can see um, in the photo there, it, it shows um, 278 yes, uh, 92 no's. That's, that would come up within seconds of people pressing yeah. the yes or no on their, mm -hmm. on their uh, machine. And so we would see that in real time, uh, just within seconds of the, the voting. So it was, we were getting live, live reporting of the number of votes right there. Very true. Now, one point uh, I did notice there was one vote that actually had a one vote swing, if you remember that. So That's right. having these machines dialed in definitely made a huge difference. You don't want to make a mistake at that point in time. The next one shows uh, the light process. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that one, the three minute? <clears throat> Yeah, you would. Um, if there was a um, enactment or a resolution that you were going to speak in favor of or against, you would get in line at these podiums that were um, there were four of them in between the um, the rows that uh, that we were seated in, and when you were called, uh, the green light would and the yellow light and the red light would all be lit, and then as you were speaking, the lights would count down until finally when it hit the red light your three minutes was up, and, and you didn't get to speak any longer than that. They, if you did try to go beyond that, they would say, you're done, sit down. Or they cut the mic at one instance. That's right, they did. <laughs> one time they had to. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, probably one of the more controversial items I have a picture of here is the next picture itself, and that talks about our finances as far as Rotary and uh, our dues. Mm -hmm. So you want to go over that a little bit? <clears throat> well... This was one that actually took us all by surprise because we had been, a um, little background, months and months before this takes place, we get a, that big, huge binder and electronic version of all of the enactments and all of the proposed resolutions that are going to be voted on um, when we're back there at the council. And in there, it said that we were going to be voting on a dues increase of a dollar a year. And we got to the, um, con to the, back to the council, and we said, w what's going on then? And they said, well, there's going to be a special presentation on how come the dues, is gonna, dues increase is going to have to be more than we had anticipated. And this was the part of the um, report that was given in favor of a forecast of a $4 annual dues increase starting in 2018. Um, and it was presented very, very well. And certainly, um, they made it very understandable that if we didn't vote in favor of this, we were going to um, basically start losing about $2 million a year. So it did pass, and um, I thought RI did a good job of explaining it to us. True. Uh, I, I agree. Um, it, I thought it was going to be a little bit more contentious and controversial, too. but it went right through. Mm -hmm. and the presentation was excellent, showing why the need was there. If it, I don't think if it, if it hadn't been presented so well, I think it would have been much more contentious. I, I, would, I would agree. Yeah. yeah. Next picture we have shows the uh, the voting. I've got a few pictures there. Voting with the cards themselves. So tell us a little bit about the voting by cards versus the voting with by um, electronic ballot. Yeah, we well, usually the uh, voting by card was for um, a vote in favor of whether it was time to close debate and it was time to vote. Um, or whether or not an amendment was going to be approved um, and that we would go back to then debate on that topic. Um, it wasn't used for the actual vote on the proposed amendment um, until <laughs> the batteries all started to wear down the last day. And at that point, we were on resolutions anyway, right. and it was pretty easy for them to sh sure. see a majority vote. But, uh, but the general rule was the green cards or the red cards were used to vote for or against whether it was time to close debate and vote or whether an amendment was going to be um, authorized or not. Got it. Okay. Um, second picture shows pretty much the same thing, just mm -hmm. a different angle of that. It was kind of impressive to see that the presider could actually distinguish between how many of one color versus another color, unless it was an overwhelming difference. 
Yeah, it was pretty impressive. And um, that, that photo we're looking at, actually, that was taken from the angle of my seat where I was in the front row during the first couple of days. And then, as you mentioned, then they moved us for, to a different location. Different location. The next picture um, shows a picture of one of the people speaking in favor or against, but it's speaking on one of the uh, resolutions. And um, there were four different stations you talked about, mm -hmm. four different mics that were in the aisleways. Tell us a little bit about that. Um, was that something that was controlled well, or was that something that seemed to be out of hand? Oh, no, I thought they controlled it very, very well. Uh, there were ushers that would make sure people would stay in line. They would hold their card high so that the presider could look down and see the number of greens and, and red cards that were being um, being waited upon, and, and, and I thought it was run very, very clear. Now, the other thing that's interesting in this photo, you can see he's down to his red dot. Yeah, so right. he's just about out of time at that point when you took that photo. <laughs> but no, I thought it was run remarkably well, and um, I was really impressed with the whole process. It was, it was really well done. So our last picture, um, this, this is what we got out of it, <laughs> the pin. <laughs> so we, I thought that was pretty impressive. It was really nice of him. That was actually a gift. It was not at the expense of Rody, but it was a gift from the uh, from Dwayne. Yeah, he actually gave that himself as a personal thank you for all of the uh, delegates. Yeah, it was a nice pin, and we know we Rotarians love our pins. <laughs> we definitely love our pins. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about your experience. Um, what, what did you get out of the council? Um, we know that it was considerably more progressive than in the past. Some of that, um, but some of your input. What did you notice and see? Well, as I mentioned, I, you know, I went there with a great deal of skepticism, thinking that um, a lot of this was already pre-decided and we were there kind of just to rubber stamp things. It didn't take long to figure out that that was anything but true. Um, it was really, some of the debate was very, very passionate and um, to the point where people were either very excited about something um, and sometimes agitated about things. So there were some people that were very, very, very passionate about what they were discussing. And it made me proud to be part of the process because um, you know, this only happens every three years. Um, there's certain change to that coming up we can talk about in a moment. But, uh, but I was uh, just impressed with being part of that democratic process. It was, it was fascinating and, and I took away from it a desire to go back. I would love to be able to serve again. Um, and it was just it was an overwhelmingly positive experience. How about the uh, flexibility? We noticed that this was very progressive this time in trying to adjust rotary and uh, I would say the guiding principles is something a little bit looser that would be able to be adopted more by the clubs. Did you notice that? Boy, did I ever. And um, it, you know, some of the things that, that were voted upon and passed overwhelmingly surprised me. I mean, some of the things on the flexibility on, on meetings, um, whether or not you even have to have um, meetings according to the way that meetings used to be described. Um, what is a meeting anymore? Um, how many times per month do you have to meet? And then attendance, the attendance requirement, which uh, basically they said a club can keep an attendance requirement or you completely abolish it if you'd like to. Uh, in fact, they went so far as to say that a club, if they want to, can modify the standard club constitution to say that uh, there's no attendance requirement at all and you can't be terminated for not, for not attending. For not attendance. And then we got to types of membership. <laughs> and uh, as we know, there's regular membership and honorary membership, uh, but now uh, you clubs are free to either keep it that way or to design corporate membership, family membership, all kinds of different membership. And I, I was surprised that, that these things were passing with huge margins True. in favor. Yeah. Did, they did away with the distinction between a regular club and an e-club. Mm -hmm. So they're just all called clubs now. Um, you, they can keep an e-club name if it's something that they'd like to do, but uh, there's no requirement to. And there is no distinction anymore in the manual procedure between an e-club and a regular club. But I thought the biggest one was the qualification of club membership. Right. Um, you know, they completely did away with the, the business and professional criteria. Um, and that surprised me. 
you know, now it's um, just a standard of being of good moral and ethical character, and, and, uh, but they did away with having to be a business owner or uh, professional or civic leader, and, and so that's a, a different, and again, passed by a huge majority. I was very surprised by that. True. Um, we have a little time here. Uh, let's go real quickly. Your um, overview on it being so international. Oh. Some of the enactments came forward that were very specific to a culture. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. And, and we saw several. Well, in fact, on the second day, we probably saw over a dozen that were dealing specifically with conflict and uh, power struggles, election contests, uh, financial irregularities, and the great importance of some of these positions, like the vice governor, which, uh, you know, here uh, in North America, we don't, I mean, obviously it's very important to have that person in place in case they're needed, but uh, it was a hugely important thing to the people in, from certain regions, and um, there was, I would say, um, heated debate <laughs> on, on those topics. That this was true. Um, one point I thought was pretty fascinating was the one uh, that came forward talking about clubs that had to be at least in existence for more than one year because clubs are popping up just for votes, right. just getting votes and getting somebody into office. <clears throat> I thought that was pretty fascinating. That and was. Then they would disappear. That's right. <laughs> and also the one that, that clubs have to exhaust all avenues of administrative relief before they can file lawsuits. Apparently, in some parts of the world, um, dozens of lawsuits are filed right after the elections to challenge the elections. True. Yeah. Fascinating. <laughs> that is fascinating. Fortunately, we don't see a lot of that here. Right. Uh, your overall view of the council delegates themselves, were you able to find a lot of new friends, uh, connections, uh, acquaintances internationally from the ex experience? Yeah, and um, Wade, that was the part that I thought was really one of the most pleasant parts of the, the entire experience was being able to um, have a beverage or um, sit down and have a meal with uh, people you'd never met before and um, find ways to communicate. It was that internationality of it was, uh, it was both overwhelming at first and then absolutely one of the most pleasant things about the whole experience. Sure. And that's, that's Rotary, uh, Rotary International and all the people we get to meet and see. Well, with that, everybody, thank you very much uh, for joining us on this. I know the council legislation, some people say it's fairly dry, but for Steve and myself, we had a great time there seeing how important it is for Rotary and Rotary International to continue on to be more progressive with everything that we think and do. And with that, thank you very much, and we will see you next time.